Welcome to Spine Academy. In this video, we're going to review cervical myelopathy. This is an excerpt from a broader course which covers the symptoms of cervical spondylosis. If you're interested in seeing the full course, we've left a link in the description. The first of the three patterns that we're going to talk about is going to be cervical myelopathy. So again, cervical myelopathy comes from spinal cord compression and spinal cord dysfunction. This slice, once again, this is an axial slice, and you can see here the spinal cord. So we're talking about the spinal cord as it relates to the structures around it. You can see that there's some arthritis here that's pressing on a nerve, but not really affecting the spinal cord. So not all arthritis in the cervical spine will affect the spinal cord. And in fact, the spinal cord can sometimes have some pressure on it, but have enough room to give where people won't necessarily have symptoms from that. Here you can see there's this disc material here, maybe some bone sperm material kind of pressing on the spinal cord. It's kind of being impressed on or imprinted here by this material right there. The ligament is a little bit thicker on this side as well. And so spinal cord dysfunction comes when there is significant pressure on the spinal cord, kind of more pressure than it can tolerate, and then people will start developing symptoms from it. There's two important things to emphasize. One is that spinal cord compression can come from the front or can come from the back. So this is, again, the back part of the body or the back of the neck here. Spinal cord can be ventral or dorsal, and that will have important implications in decision-making and how to treat it if it comes to surgery. The other thing to mention is that the spinal cord has room around it. So sometimes there can be narrowing around the spinal cord, or stenosis as we call it, that's asymptomatic, that people, the spinal cord, as long as it's working okay, they don't have myelopathy. So we don't necessarily care as much about just the fact that there is encroachment. So the symptoms that people develop from cervical myelopathy relate a lot to the anatomy. So we'll talk, take a, a step back for one moment. This is a slice again through a cadaver. It's a sagittal slice. The front of the spine is here. And you can see the bones and discs here. Here's a fairly large disc herniation causing pressure on the spinal cord, which is this structure right there. Now the spinal cord, when you look at it, there's this disc material pressing and there's some swelling or some signal change within it, this kind of reddish purplish stripe that's in the middle of it, indicating that there is a fair amount of pressure on it, even some degree of spinal cord injury. The spinal cord goes from the brain downwards, and in terms of distribution, that has very important implications. When the spinal cord is not working right here, it can affect the conduction of signals from the brain down to anything past that. So it will affect all of the nerves and neurological function at that level below. It doesn't have to involve all of them, but it may involve anything below that level, just like if you're squeezing on a tree trunk. The, it can affect the arms and the legs when it involves the cervical spine. And often, because the spinal cord is kind of small and there's pressure on it, the symptoms will be bilateral. So in terms of distribution, when people have cervical myelopathy, it can affect anything from the level of compression down on both sides into the arms and the legs. Now, the specifics of the symptoms that people will develop, let's get into them individually. We'll talk about the arms first and then the legs. In the arms, the symptoms that people get with myelopathy or spinal cord dysfunction are problems with clumsiness. So difficulty with things like buttoning their shirt, zipping up their zippers, putting on their jewelry, activities like that. Those are common things that people do on a day-to-day -day basis and they see that they have kind of a loss of dexterity with that. Most patients chalk it up to age, but it is a little more rapidly progressive than you would expect with age alone. People will have stiffness in their fingers, so that can affect problems with typing or using their phone or playing the piano or an instrument where their fingers just don't have the same degree of fine motor function or dexterity that they once had. People will often notice that they're dropping objects and will say if they're not paying close attention, they can drop a coffee cup or a, or, or a cup of water or something like that. Uh, or even like a, if they're not, if they're holding onto a sheet of paper, they'll say if they're not paying close attention, it'll kind of slip right out of their fingers. People will have difficulty with dropping objects in their hands. Uh, all of those fine motor kind of dysfunctions um, are, are the classic features of cervical myelopathy in the arms. In terms of leg involvement, and again, not everybody with cervical spinal cord compression will have involvement of their legs, but they can easily have them. And the symptoms that they will develop will be particularly loss of balance. People feel like they're drunk when they're walking. They feel unsteady, like they're bouncing into walls and kind of drifting from side to side. And it's because not all of the signals are making it from their brain down into their legs. And importantly, not all the signals are making it from their legs back up into their, into their brain. They'll have stiffness in their legs, and you might notice that in the walk, it's a little bit Frankensteinish. When people walk, they'll have spasticity into their legs. 
Uh, and people sometimes notice weakness, not always, but sometimes notice weakness with maneuvers, particularly that involve strength in the thighs, so going up steps, getting out of a chair, things like that. People don't have to have that, but that's another thing that people will develop when they have myelopathy involving the legs. So they can affect, again, myelopathy can affect the arms and the legs, and the classic features of them are problems with clumsiness, dropping things, balance dysfunction. In terms of the characteristics that are a little bit unique and don't necessarily fall into those nice categories, it's important to mention that myelopathy need not come with pain. Now again, when people have arthritis, they can have other things that cause pain, but myelopathy unto itself, spinal cord compression and spinal cord dysfunction does not usually cause pain. It can be an entirely painless phenomenon, which is something that you know, really that keeps people from going to the hospital because nobody wants to see a doctor, nobody wants to go to a hospital if they don't have to. And the fact that it's painless, people often kind of write it off for a while before they, they finally seek attention for it. Um, another thing that people will notice sometimes is a Lermite's phenomenon. It's not super common, but that's a condition where people will kind of lean forward, or I've seen it even where they lean back, and the spinal cord will get kind of dinged. You could imagine if this person leaned forward and the spinal cord got a little jolt to it, that you'd get a lightning bolt that kind of goes through your body. It's like a shock-like sensation that goes through your body. The name for that is something called a Lermite's phenomenon. And then lastly, people can notice numbness that really will affect from that level below. And that's really related to loss of sensory fibers and things conducting back up to the brain from, from further down. Those are things that people can or cannot notice with more cervical myelopathy, but things to just be aware of when you're talking about the symptoms that people will have with it. Now, when you go see your doctor uh, for evaluation for this, one of the things a specialist in cervical pathology or, or spinal pathology will look for uh, are findings unique to myelopathy. The, the first and foremost thing is really reflexes. So of course, we'll talk about a variety of different, but reflexes are generally brisk. So we'll check your reflex like in the bicep or the brachioradialis, and it'll be quite brisk. And when people have myelopathy, a lot of patients think that's a good thing because the reflexes are good, but it's not really, good is just kind of the right amount, so to speak, like too brisk or not brisk enough, those are things that we really kind of care about. Classically, with spinal cord dysfunction or myelopathy, people will have brisk reflexes or what we call hyperreflexia, and that'll be into the arms and the legs, again, from the level of compression below. Other things to notice will be something called a Hoffman sign, which is a sign of hyperreflexia as well. So if they're flicking your finger, that's why they're doing it. They'll look at some reflexes in your feet. All of that is to kind of gauge your spinal cord reflexes and spinal cord function. And in general, hyperreflexia is a feature of cervical myelopathy. We'll look at the gait. That's the other thing that we'll really think about. It's like when we'll, we'll have people stand up and walk. We'll have you do one foot in front of the other to kind of make sure that's something you can do on your own. It's like a sobriety test, effectively. Um, and if people have balance problems with that, it doesn't mean for sure they have spinal cord dysfunction. But that is a potential explanation part of the picture. So we'll do something called a tandem gait, which is one foot in front of the other, kind of heel to toe, and see if people have uh, any abnormalities with that. We check for sensory loss. We'll check for kind of increases or changes in tone. Classically, people will have some degree of increase and tone, that's usually after longer lasting or longer standing kind of pathology, but we'll see that as well. And of course, do a detailed motor exam to kind of see if there's any weakness. And particular patterns of weakness may clue us into the presence or absence of myelopathy. The reason we take myelopathy so seriously is because a lot of times it does not get better on its own. For the most part, cervical myelopathy is a slowly progressive thing. It's not rapidly progressive. Uh, it can be, but it's generally a slowly progressive phenomenon, generally over the span of months. That's part of the reason people don't seek urgent attention for it, because it's such a slow and insidious decline, they don't necessarily you know, pay, seek attention right away. Uh, it's usually a progressive thing where people kind of lose function. Most often it's punctuated, which means that people kind of have a certain neurological function, they see a little bit of a decline, a little bit of a decline. They kind of see punctuated decline with periods of kind of stability in between. But what's important is that it generally does not get better on its own. And that while the time course of decline can really vary, the fact that it declines is part of what motivates us to recommend surgery for myelopathy as a general rule. Now, it's something where the timing of that and how quickly that's something to really discuss with the specialist that you're seeing for it. But cervical myelopathy is something we generally recommend surgery for. There are grading systems for severity of myelopathy. And we're not going to get into it in this talk, but you can look them up quite readily. That is definitely a consideration in when and how quickly we recommend, and even to some extent, what type of surgery we recommend if we get to doing that. But that is kind of an overview of cervical myelopathy, not only the distribution of it, but the features, the exam findings, and the natural history or the course that we expect it to take if people have those symptoms. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future content, we'd welcome them in the comment section below.